Hey, thanks for joining me and thanks especially for having me for this year's Science for Alaska series. Today, I'd like to share a story with you about the science and my experience on the largest Arctic expedition in history. I'm Melinda Webster. I'm a sea ice geophysicist from the Geophysical Institute at the University of Alaska. Now, this expedition was a year-long drift experiment in which a ship was deliberately frozen into the ice pack with this expectation that it would drift across the Arctic Basin for an entire year. It was a colossal scientific and logistical effort involving more than 30 countries. So before we begin, let's take a look at what motivated this expedition and brought together so many of the world's leading experts on Arctic climate. The foundation of this expedition was centered on the Arctic sea ice cover and better understanding its seasonal evolution, as well as its interactions with the atmosphere, ocean, and ecosystem. Sea ice is an extremely dynamic medium. It's constantly moving with the winds and ocean currents, and it's also cycling in and out with growth and melt. Each winter, the sea ice cover expands and thickens as it spreads to more southerly latitudes. In spring, with the return of sunlight and warming temperatures, it begins to melt and eventually shrinks back to a minimum area each September. Each year, it cycles in and it cycles out with the seasons. It's like a constant rhythm of the Arctic Ocean, and it's one that we've been able to carefully monitor from space for more than 40 years thanks to satellites. This long-term satellite record has been incredibly revealing. Through it, we can now see that the rhythm of the Arctic Ocean is changing. With climate change, the Arctic is warming faster than anywhere on Earth. As a consequence, less and less sea ice is surviving the summer melt season. What used to be this old, thick, resilient sea ice cover is now a thinner, younger, weaker ice pack that's melting away each summer. These changes are happening on a rapid time scale, and we don't yet fully understand how a now seasonal Arctic sea ice pack interacts with the ocean, the atmosphere, and the ecosystem, and for that matter, our climate. These huge knowledge gaps are what made the Mosaic expedition possible. We desperately need to understand how the seasonal Arctic system behaves and how all of its components interact to better understand how they will influence our weather and our climate. So what does Mosaic stand for? It's the Multidisciplinary Drifting Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate. Its main goal was to document how the ocean, sea ice, atmosphere, and ecosystem interact with one another as they seasonally evolve for an entire year. This expedition used all of the best tools in the toolkit, using climate and weather models, satellite observations, and previous ground observations to identify the key knowledge gaps. These knowledge gaps were then used to design the field expedition for targeting field measurements. On the personnel side, the expedition was extremely large and extremely diverse, with more than 500 scientists representing more than 37 nationalities. The gender breakdown was interesting, where about 70% of the research team was male, while 60% of the leadership roles, like the one I had, were female. All in all, the expedition did an excellent job in bringing more diversity to the field, and having so many different perspectives on board made it a true success. Now, to begin a year-long drift experiment, one needs to find the perfect flow. For one, it needs to survive an entire year. And for two, it needs to have both seasonal ice and multi-year ice, or that old ice that survives the summer melt season. In this way, we can see how both ice types seasonally evolved and how they affect and are affected by the atmosphere and the ocean. Finding the best starting point of the drift experiment required a bit of detective work. Using satellite measurements of sea ice drift together with models, forecasts of ice drift could be made to pinpoint an optimal location, which happened to be just north of the Siberian coast. It turns out that this location already had an interesting history. It's where, 125 years ago, that Friedhof Nansen began the Fram expedition, which, similar to Mosaic, was a drift experiment that traveled across the Arctic Basin. The Fram and Mosaic expeditions had several similarities, but also some big differences. They both had similar drift tracks, but they used very different vessels. The Fram was a sailboat, while Mosaic used the German icebreaker Polar Stern. Now, both vessels became frozen into the ice pack around about the same time in October, and both happened to melt out at the same time in August. 
But what took the Fram three years only took the Mosaic Expedition 10 months. So what would have caused such a big difference in the amount of time it took to drift across the Arctic Ocean? The faster drift of Mosaic was caused by a combination of factors. Arctic sea ice is thinner than it used to be, and thinner sea ice is easier to move around with the winds and ocean currents. Another factor was the strong Arctic Oscillation Index in the winter of 2019. The Arctic Oscillation is an index that represents a specific atmospheric pattern of sea level pressure. In years with a positive index, strong winds flush sea ice out of the Arctic through Fram Strait at a faster rate, which means that it takes less time for sea ice to drift across the Arctic. In the winter of 2019, the Mosaic Expedition was right in the midst of the strongest positive Arctic Oscillation Index observed, and its rapid drift was a notable consequence of this. Despite the fast drift, the original goal of the expedition was still achieved. We are still able to observe the seasonal transformation of Arctic sea ice. Now, I'm going to switch gears a little here and highlight the science that I'm involved in and what motivated my participation in the Mosaic Expedition. There are two key aspects that I'm focused on here, and that is mass balance and optical properties. Mass balance describes the changes in snow and sea ice, and of particular interest, the transformation from snow to melt ponds in summer and to the formation of ice in autumn. Of equal interest is understanding how these transformations affect the optical properties of the surface, how light is reflected, absorbed, and transmitted through. All of these aspects are incredibly important for assessing and improving climate models, but they're also extremely important for improving satellite measurements of Earth. My work in Mosaic is funded by NASA, and what I saw happening during the planning phase of the expedition was this incredible opportunity to use Mosaic data as the ultimate blueprint for interpreting satellite data. Satellites use electromagnetic radiation. Different wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum reveal different kinds of information about the Earth's surface. For example, microwave radiation can tell us whether there's sea ice or open ocean, while visible radiation can be used to calculate the elevation of a surface to within an inch of accuracy. All satellite measurements are affected by the conditions in the atmosphere or on the ground, whether ice is cold or melting, whether there's snow or a melt pond, and so on. So I've proposed to use this comprehensive year-long field dataset to push the capabilities of certain satellites to retrieve new information about the Arctic sea ice cover. Now I just need to join the ship to begin my data collection. The polar storm became frozen into the Arctic ice pack in October 2019, and despite some challenges, it went like clockwork. The expedition was broken up into different legs in which crew and scientists would rotate in and out. My journey was to begin in the spring of 2020, and I was to stay, into the, stay in the field for the remaining six months of the expedition. But in February, COVID-19 became a global pandemic, and that really put a halt on everything. The rotation was canceled, borders were closed. It just seemed like an utterly hopeless situation. But thanks to the National Science Foundation and the Alfred Wigner Institute, a solution was found. If there was a way to get crew and scientists to a hotel in Germany, we could quarantine there, take four COVID tests, and as long as we cleared, we could take a German research vessel to meet the polar stern. But this came at a cost. The polar stern would have to leave the observatory and meet us halfway for the rotation. Now, this is important because it creates a hole in the time series, and also there are a lot of people that could no longer go on the expedition. And on top of this, there was a storm. Just a day before the polar stern is to leave the observatory, a strong storm hits. The ice is compressed and pulled apart, breaking it up into pieces. Instruments and equipment had to be evacuated from the ice, but not everything could be rescued in time. On the right is one of the unlucky infrastructures demolished in a newly formed ridge during the storm. Meanwhile, along with the other scientists and crew, I began quarantine in a hotel in Bremerhaven. It took about two weeks to clear quarantine, and after that, we traveled by a German research ship to Svalbard, where we waited for the icebreaker to arrive. After having left home for more than a month, the rotation finally happened, and not wasting any time, we immediately headed north to the ice plaque, 
which we arrived to within a day. Traveling through the ice was much calmer than in the ocean, and this allowed us to locate and fix instruments on board that were hastily thrown in and rescued during the chaos of the storm in May. While we were traveling north, we were figuratively in the dark about what we would find at the observatory. Had it broken up even more since the storm, or had things remained calm and perhaps there was something left over that we could do something with scientifically? We had good reason to be anxious. Sea ice is extremely dynamic. This video shows the kind of ice motion that can happen within a relatively short time period. This is a compilation of satellite images from the Sheba Field Campaign in 1997 to 1998. As you can see, in no time at all, the original square shape of the ice cover is totally unrecognizable. Understanding that such dynamics like this were very much a possibility was constantly on our minds, and, but all we could do was just try to remain patient and wait until we arrived. On June 17th, we arrived to the observatory and find it in pieces. But there's one piece, a remnant, that holds sites where time series measurements were made. It's here that we decide to re-establish the camp. So how did we go about this on a substantially smaller area, just one kilometer in diameter? Through a tremendous amount of teamwork, determination, and positivity, we created a metropolis of science on the flow. On the left half of the flow, highlighted in a lot of red, was our seasonal ice. On the right half was our multi-year ice. So we're able to do the science that we originally sought out to do. So, but despite the limited time that we had and the challenges we faced, we were still able to get a lot accomplished. We did an incredible amount of strong science. I want to redo that, sorry. Um, take two for audio, slide 16. Through a tremendous amount of teamwork, determination, and positivity, we created a metropolis of science on the flow. On the left half of the flow, highlighted in a lot of red, was our seasonal ice. On the right half was our multi-year ice, so we were able to do the original science that we sought out to do. Despite the limited time that we had and the challenges we faced, we accomplished an incredible amount of good science, and this had everything to do with the people. Like I briefly mentioned before, a lot of the scientists that came on this lake were actually fill-ins for those who could no longer go due to the pandemic. In this photograph, the ICE team is shown, the largest team on board, and several of them had never seen or stood on sea ice before. This didn't matter. In fact, their positive energy, open-mindedness, and willingness to help one another was simply awe-inspiring. I couldn't have been luckier to be a group leader of this team and to get the tremendous amount of support from my colleagues, Bonnie Light, Don Perovich, and Chris Polichinski, who were unable to join the expedition due to the pandemic. So what did we do on Lake 4? Well, we wanted to capture the seasonal evolution of the Arctic sea ice cover, and we did. We got to see how it evolved from this snowy landscape to something covered in melt ponds to complete melt. This seasonal evolution is controlled by sunlight, and the amount of light that gets reflected and absorbed and transmitted is all controlled by the conditions on the surface of the ice. Is it covered by snow, which is really reflective, or is it covered by melt ponds, which let in a lot of light and transmit that light through to the upper ocean? The amount of light that reaches the upper ocean is extremely important for driving the cycle of phytoplankton. So if there's a lot of melt ponds on the surface, this means that a lot more light can reach those phytoplankton and kickstart the foundation of the food web. What my colleagues and I set out to do was to measure everything about sea ice, including its albedo. Albedo is the reflectivity of a surface, and for sea ice, its albedo changes as it melts. So for the melt season, as melt ponds grow and as they cover a larger area of the surface, the albedo decreases. But we don't have a good understanding of how the albedo evolves throughout the melt season for seasonal ice compared to multi-year ice. During the summer, albedo is incredibly important for determining how quickly or how slowly the sea ice will melt, and melt ponds control the surface albedo. What I set out to do was to measure the aerial coverage and the depth of these melt ponds, as well as their distribution on the seasonal ice and the multi-year ice. <laughs> 
My colleagues and I set up a route that circumnavigated the flow, and on this route, we measured snow depth, melt pond depth, and the sea ice thickness. Now, for snow depth, we had this really cool device. It was an automated snow depth probe, and we adapted it for measuring melt pond depth. In this way, we could take many, many measurements in a short amount of time, which was really nice. Now, for measuring sea ice thickness, we used an instrument called a GEM2, and this is an electromagnetic induction device, and through electric magnetic currents, we're able to detect the interface between the seawater and the bottom of the ice, and from that, we can derive sea ice thickness. Through this data set, we are able to catalog the transformation of a snow cover to a sea ice surface covered in melt ponds. At the beginning, we had a rather deep snow cover that was really warm and wet and really difficult to walk through. It actually made setting up infrastructure quite difficult. But you can see over time in the red squares that the snow cover decreased with melt, and this in turn made it possible for melt ponds to grow and deepen over time, which is shown in the blue circles. And they were actually quite fun to walk through until about the end of the uh, melt season in July, where the melt ponds began to melt through entirely and our route was no longer passable because it was just open ocean. These melt pond depth measurements are really important for also relating to airborne satellite measurements of melt ponds. Part of the work I'm doing is using laser altimeter data to derive melt pond depth from aircraft and satellites. Now, I've never looked at these compared to field measurements, and I have no way of knowing if they're within the realm of normal. So how do they compare? This is a melt pond depth of about 34 centimeters, and it's not even in the deepest part of the melt pond. When we compare this derivation to our ground measurements, we find that it's on the higher end. So maybe it's possible, but it's still a little unsettling. Uh, so what I did is I found the deepest melt pond on the mosaic flow that I could find, and I went and measured it. Measuring this gigantic melt pond required a survival suit and a little bit of swimming. So in the upper left, you can see me <laughs> wading through this very, very deep pond collecting measurements. And just a few days later, this melt pond drained. Uh, you can see the same pond, and I'm walking through it in the lower right, and it's much smaller and much shallower than it used to be. So when melt ponds drain, there's something that's going on with the sea ice, and it's really important to consider. Sea ice is full of these pockets of salt and brine, and as temperatures increase, these little pockets expand and the ice becomes more porous until it becomes interconnected to the ocean and all of the melt water within the melt ponds can drain. So we did a before and after a snapshot of what the melt pond depths were like in this gigantic melt pond. And what we found is, on average, pond depths can get more than 60 centimeters in depth. And after drainage, they become much, much shallower, more like 10 centimeters in depth. So relating this to these satellite and airborne retrievals, we're able to get the higher end of melt pond depths but it's still a question on whether we can retrieve these shallower melt ponds from space. Melt pond water is primarily fresh water. It's from snow melt. And when these massive melt ponds drain, it's like it's injecting a ton of fresh water into the upper ocean, and this fresh water can form a freshwater lens. So the fresh water is very buoyant, it doesn't really mix or sink in, and it increases the stratification of the ocean. Now the reason this is important, because this freshwater lens can act like a barrier for algae that's trying to reach the sea ice. So if this algae is unable to get into the ice to have nutrients and to get a lot of sunlight, this can hurt their ability to thrive. And that's important because they form the foundation to the Arctic food web. Along the transect route that we walked on a near daily basis, uh, we quantified the proportion of the surface that was covered in melt ponds and snow and bare sea ice, and this was really important for directly relating to the albedo measurements. We took two types of albedo measurements on mosaic. Uh, 
The first one is broadband albedo, which is the total reflectivity of a given surface type. The second type is spectral albedo, and what this tells us is how reflective a surface is for a given wavelength within the electromagnetic spectrum. Now this second type is really useful for my work because my work involves data from ISAT2. ISAT2 is a photon counting LiDAR that uses the 532 nanometer wavelength. So what this means is it's using a green laser and it's shooting light down to the Earth's surface. In fact, if you're standing underneath it, you might see a green flash. And it's counting the amount of time that it takes for those green photons to hit the Earth's surface, be reflected back, and hit the satellite sensor. Now, since we know the time travel involved and the speed of light, we can calculate the surface elevation of where those photons hit. And since we know the surface elevation and we have an idea of how dense sea ice is, we can calculate sea ice thickness. Now, this is the first time that a photon counting LIDAR has been put into space for measuring Earth's surface. And we really don't know what the photons are gonna look like when they return from the Earth's surface during summer when the ice surface begins to melt. Because we have these spectral albedo time series, the melt pond depths, the melt pond coverage, the sea ice thickness, we have all this valuable information from the ground that we can use to better interpret the photon returns from ISAT2. Now this will help us refine existing algorithms, especially those that are identifying different surface types like melt ponds, but it'll also allow us to push the capability of the satellite, like for instance, trying to retrieve melt pond depth. The comprehensive data set from Mosaic will also help us assess and improve physics and climate models. So one of the problems I'm really interested in looking at is how well do climate models represent melt ponds? Do they capture their evolution okay? Do they capture how they spread in coverage and how they drain and their associated changes in surface albedo? We really don't know, and so that's going to be an exciting thing to look into in the coming year. By mid-July, the snow cover had entirely melted, and the surface of the ice cover was melting rapidly. We started seeing these weird, dark patches show up, and upon closer inspection, we found a bit of a surprise. What these dark patches turned out to be was sediment, mud, and all sorts of things like clamshells, seaweed, and starfish. It was incredible because this stuff is not normally found on drifting sea ice. And what it originated from, it tells a story about the history of this flow. It came from land fast ice in the East Laptive Sea and it carried all of these things across the Arctic to Fram Strait. It's pretty incredible and that definitely was an interesting part of the mosaic story. By late July, our flow is in a highly advanced state of melt, and it kind of resembles the lunar landscape, as you can see here. But it was also drifting precariously close to the ice edge. Each day we get a set of satellite images, and we could see that our neighboring flows were disappearing one by one. And at some point we became the only flow, and it was decided that we needed to start packing up camp. So we carried out an orderly evacuation, we pulled in all of the instrumentation, we pulled in all of the power cables, and despite cracks starting to form and visits from polar bears, everything went incredibly smoothly. Even though we are technically evacuating, we still made plans to get some science done. So here is an example of one of the schedules we have put together every evening for planning the following day. So you can see it was a rather jam-packed schedule but we are never able to fulfill it. The morning of July 31st, really early, some swell came through from a nearby storm and it totally disintegrated the flow. It broke up into tiny pieces and that was the end of the mosaic flow. We still had three months left in the expedition and we were only a few days out from the next rotation of crew and scientists. During that time, we went around and located these instruments that were no longer transmitting their data to satellites. 
This was really important to recover them because they captured a year-long time series, and without the recovery, all of that data would have been lost. So what was left for the fifth and final leg of the Mosaic expedition? We had no flow, and we had no time series. So we decided that the best thing that we could do scientifically was to capture the transition into the freeze-up season, when snow begins to accumulate again and ponds begin to freeze over. Now, to do this, we had to find a new flow, and we needed to head northward where temperatures were cooler and freeze-up would happen earlier than more southerly latitudes. During the transit northward, science never stopped. We deployed instruments, we conducted oceanographic surveys, and we did standardized ice observations from the ship. What these ice observations do is they characterize the surface conditions of the surrounding ice. So we estimate what the sea ice concentration is, which is the area covered in ice. We estimate the sea ice thickness. We look at the air temperature, and we also estimate what area is covered by melt ponds. And you can see this evolution of the surface conditions as we went northward and as we went back southward out of the ice pack. And one striking thing about this is with the oncoming winter, the temperatures plummeted, the melt ponds went away, and the ice got thicker and more concentrated. At about 88 degrees north, we stopped just in time to establish a camp on a seasonal ice flow just before the onset of freezing. I continued the transect surveys at this new flow, getting a time series of melt ponds, snow depth, and ice thickness measurements throughout our time there. Interestingly, there was no detectable change in sea ice thickness or melt pond depths while we were there. In hindsight, this makes sense. Melt was no longer in full swing like before, and we were just weeks away from the onset of continuous freezing. Even with the onset of freezing, it can take multiple weeks for the sea ice in upper ocean to cool down and to start forming ice again. We also continued our albedo time series measurements and successfully captured the transition into a snow-covered ice scape. Going from an open pond to a snow-covered surface boosted the surface reflectivity by more than 40%. That means that 40% more sunlight was being reflected back into space. Throughout Lake 5, we experienced dramatic swings in weather. We had rain, snow, sleet, freezing drizzle, and more. We linked these weather events to changes to all the components of the system. To the snow, melt ponds, and sea ice, to primary productivity, and to the mixing in the upper ocean, and also, of course, to the albedo. Here's one example of the effect of rainfall on spectral albedo. It dramatically reduces the surface reflectivity, which is not only important from a surface energy budget perspective, but also for interpreting satellite data, such as those photon returns from ISAT 2 We only had five weeks left on the float before we needed to head home, and on September 20th, we departed from the camp. Now this date was special to all of us because it's exactly 365 days since the German icebreaker Polar Stern had left Tromsø, Norway to begin the Mosaic expedition. Even though the expedition was hit with a lot of challenges from the pandemic to the ice breaking up, it was still a success. It created a legacy of data sets that's going to be valuable for science decades to come. To bring it back to the big picture, Arctic sea ice is thinner and less extensive than ever before, and it's changing at a rapid rate. Through Mosaic, we're updating our baseline understanding of this environment and how it operates within the global system. Through this better understanding, we'll be able to improve our ability to predict what's going to happen with our climate and our weather. Hey, that wraps up my presentation. Thank you so much for listening in. I hope you found it interesting. It's been a real privilege sharing this story with you. I hope that you're now as excited as I am about the scientific discoveries that'll stem from this epic expedition. Thank you. Uh, we're ready for questions now, Melinda. We'll have people drop questions in the Zoom chat here, or you can go on over to the Facebook chat um, on that post, and Melinda will take a look for questions there and happily answer them.
Great, thank you all so much. Um, I see one question already and feel free to post your questions in the Zoom chat and we'll compile them all and try to get to all of them tonight. So the first question is, what if Amundsen and Nansen hadn't made those earlier measurements? Would today's measurements have been less interesting? So I'm gonna give a stereotypical science answer and that is every data point is precious. So the more measurements we have, the more we can piece together a better understanding of what's happening. And it's really hard to tie in just snapshots of something. So that's again why this mosaic expedition was really exciting. We got to stay there for a full year and watch this evolution rather than just getting one little snapshot of it. So I hope that addresses your question. Okay, it looks like there's another one. Do any living organisms live in melt ponds? Yes, they do. Uh, in fact, there are all sorts of algae that can live in them. And sometimes the algae will stay in there and get frozen in. In the next summer, if the ice survives, uh, as things begin to melt, that algae will come back and repopulate that melt pond. So melt ponds can be a place where algae live. Um, it's pretty extreme for them though. It's usually a freshwater area and algae tend to like seawater, but there are some that live there. So don't drink too much melt pond water. Okay, another question is, um, while walking in the ponds, was there any risk of stepping into a hole in the ice or even a shallow pocket? Yes, and one of the requirements for doing measurements or collecting data in these melt ponds, we had to wear survival suits. So these were suits that uh, don't allow any seawater to come in. You're perfectly dry and you'll stay afloat. And there were times that we fell through. Um, it's really hard to judge the thickness of the ice when, um, especially in the late melt season, when the ice is really thin and it just looks dark and sketchy, but you still want the data. So if you fall in, you're safe. It's just a little embarrassing. Okay. Um, and one of the questions is, what are the physical dangers you had to consider mm -hmm. in traversing sea ice? Oh gosh, well, I would have to say the Polar Stern crew did a phenomenal job. So they're using ice navigation charts, they're using satellite images to find the most efficient path to get to a flow. Um, one thing that they tend to avoid are ridges, which are areas where the ice has come together and have been compressed to get really thick. And those are really hard on a ship. They can back up and ram through ridges. It's really time consuming and it's also consuming a lot of fuel. So they just in general avoid that. And there's always multiple people on the bridge looking out and they have powerful spotlights too. Okay, I'm looking for other questions. Here we are. Was there a large presence of polar bears during your expedition? Yes, and I would say, I, I think like four, so this summer like from about May to August, we had a lot of polar bear visits. We were drifting closer to Greenland, so we we're between Greenland and Svalbard. And this is an area where polar bears are known to frequent and travel on the ice. And we had one, or we had several polar bears visit at one time they were visiting once a day for a week um, and they were different polar bears. So there were quite a few, but as we repositioned closer toward the, towards the North Pole, we didn't have as many polar bears visiting us. And that may have been just where we were and the availability of food for them. Um, let's see, when will the Arctic Ocean be ice free? That's a really great question. And this is why cli climate models or earth system models are so important because they can give us a bit of a better understanding of when that date or time frame may be. But there's a lot of uncertainty. I was going on about how we need to improve model physics and this is why we wanna know when that Arctic will become ice free. So currently there's an estimation between 2040 and 2060. And they have this wide range and they have a lot of uncertainty. So it'll be interesting. There are things like a intra-comparison um, study that's done 
every few years of all of the Earth system models in the world to make these projections and to try to narrow down that uncertainty and narrow down when that's going to happen. And there's a new report coming out in a couple of years that will give us a refined number. So for now, 2040 to 2060, but maybe we'll have a better idea in the next couple of years. Okay, let's see. We have a question that says, when you said that the ice was thinner and had less area than ever before, does that mean that when the Earth went through the last ice age, there was hardly any ice in the Arctic? So what I meant by the ice is um, decreasing, it's becoming less extensive and it's becoming thinner. Those changes are more rapid than our uh, record using paleoclimate proxies. So looking back thousands of years, there have been these changes in the Arctic. It has decreased in size, but not as fast as we're seeing now. This change that we're documenting by satellite observations, this is faster than anything we've seen in the paleoclimate record. And that's pretty astounding. Okay, let's see more questions. Does multi-year ice reflect differently than seasonal ice? That's a great question and we don't know yet, but we think so. That's one of the exciting data sets that we collected on Mosaic and we're going to make these comparisons. But we have some ideas that perhaps if you were looking from space, they might have different reflectivity because melt ponds cover them differently. Multi-year ice is older ice that has a really rough surface but because it's so rough on the surface, that means these melt ponds can't spread out as laterally. They're constrained by that uh, topography on the ice surface. But for seasonal ice, it tends to be smoother. So this meltwater can spread out. And if it spreads out, that means more of the surface area is covered in a dark surface. If it's darker, it's absorbing a lot more sunlight. So we think there's a difference, but we're gonna look at the data and get some really good numbers and make sure that's really the case. Uh, question is, do you use a tether when you are walking in deep melt ponds? Um, we didn't have a tether, but we had a throw rope available in case anything happened, like say you're about to drop your instrument and you wanna make sure you have something steady that you can hold on to. So you always had a partner for sure and you always, carried a safety backpack that had a throw rope and all sorts of emergency equipment. They really prioritized safety on this expedition. And that's one thing I think in comparison to previous expeditions, that was impressive. It, it was a good feeling to work on the ice with this group. A question, how are, in Alaska, there is less multi-year sea ice than there used to be. Is this the same where Mosaic was? What was the percentage of multi-year ice compared to first-year ice? Well, that's a great question. Um, so yes, there's definitely less multi-year ice than there used to be. And that was similar for mosaic, but there is some fluctuations in the amount of ice in a given area, just because interannual variability. It's like when you think about snow, is it gonna be a good year for skiing or a bad year for skiing? You can kind of get that variability in sea ice coverage depending on where you are. So where Mosaic was, they found a multi-year ice slope, but it was really, really, really thin. So that's not what the Arctic used to be. Uh, multi-year sea ice on average used to be three meters thick, and now it's about 1.6 meters thick on average. So even though there's still some multi-year sea ice left, it's definitely thinner than it used to be, and that was the case for mosaic. And for the fraction of the flow that was covered in multi-year sea ice and first-year sea ice, it was nearly half and half. One question is, did you have to shoot polar bears or could you chase them or entice them off? Well, we often would just uh, make a loud sound and that would scare them off if they were getting too close to equipment. Well, first of all, if a polar bear was approaching, we would go back on the ship. That was always a priority because we didn't want to alter any of the behavior of the polar bear unnecessarily because it's their home, right? But if a polar bear was getting too curious and it wanted to check out our equipment and maybe start chewing on the equipment, 
we would start making noise. And one of the things would be banging poles on the ship that usually worked because it's an unusual sound and it's startling and they didn't like it and that normally worked. Um, in a couple of cases, I think a handful of cases, very few, we did use flare guns that we would shoot up and make a loud pop and that would be sufficient to scare the polar bear off. We never had to use a rifle and shoot a polar bear. They, they didn't get too curious like that. There were no issues. Um, let's see. How will changes in Arctic salinity and density impact ocean currents of thermohaline circulation, or better known as the global ocean conveyor belt? Oh, that's a great question. And I can't give a straightforward answer to that. I'm not an oceanographer in that sense, but my limited understanding is this. As the ice melts and as there's more fresh water input from rivers, the Arctic is going to be fresher. And that can affect global circulation, but you know, it's really difficult to tease apart these changes. Um, I'm not sure if we can really say that there's gonna be a sudden shutdown. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's not the case. And there have been modeling studies that have shown that's not the case, but I don't know how that's gonna be a subtle change over time. Um, that's a good question. And if I do ever find the answer out, I'll be sure to publicize it. One question is, what are some of the next steps to understanding sea ice now that mosaic is over? Wow, that's, oh, there's lots of things we wanna do for next steps. I think for me, one of them is putting mosaic into context. So I was saying that there can be interannual variability and we did see some unusual conditions on mosaic. There was a really fast drift. There was unusual atmospheric patterns. So understanding how that fits within the context of what we measured. Now, the atmosphere, the ice and ocean all interact. So if there's some unusual conditions in one, it will have cascading effects on the other. So now it's about piecing together all of these different facets of the story and making sure that we understand how it works and how it fits into the longer term picture of climate change. So is the ice melt that we saw, is that similar to what's been observed before? We need to go back and start digging into this data and make these comparisons. So those are the next steps is understanding what we saw and placing it into context. Oh, a good question. What other countries participated in this expedition? Well, there were over 30 countries, and I'm afraid I can't remember all of them, but certainly there was Canada, Norway, Germany, Switzerland, US, uh, and Brazil, and China, Russia. There was, it was a massive effort. Um, I wish I could remember all of them, but that's not to say that that represented just 30 countries, there were, I think, over 38 or 40 or even more nationalities represented because a lot of these people are working at different institutes in different countries. So it was extremely diverse. I think that is one of the things that made it quite special. Um, let's see. Did you see an abundance of ring seals when you were around polar bears? I'm not sure which kind of seals these were, but we did see a lot of seals during the summer. And they're extremely curious. You'd be taking measurements and they would just pop up and look at you. So they were very, very common. And I think, again, that's why there were probably so many polar bears around during the summer. Let's see. One great question, does the sea ice follow ocean currents or does it have to have a different flow due to wind melting? Oh, okay. So I think the answer will depend on whether you're talking to an atmospheric scientist or an ocean, the wind or the ocean plays a large role. But my understanding is that both the wind and the ocean play equal, role, uh, equal role, roles in pushing ice and causing it to drift. And as ice melts and it becomes thinner, it's a lot easier to push. It's kind of like if you were to flick an ice cube versus push a really big iceberg it takes a lot more force to push a bigger chunk of ice. So as the Arctic ice pack is becoming thinner, it's actually becoming more dynamic. It's moving faster over time. And we've been able to document that from space, which is pretty cool. 
did you ever start running low on supplies? Yes, we ran out of some of the best chocolate during our leg. That was a disaster, but it was okay. We survived. Uh, we did run out of Nutella on a different leg, but you know, all in all, we were okay. Um, I think towards the end, we had hardly any fruit, but you know, that's part of it. You accept those challenges. And if those are the real challenges, that means it's going pretty well. On Polar Stern, was there any recognition of indigenous knowledge of sea ice dynamics? That's a great question. And you know, I don't think that was much of a discussion during the expedition, but it's definitely becoming a part of the discussion now. Like, what do we know and how does this compare to what's previously known and how can we best interpret this? So it's almost like an after effect, but not in a bad way. It's like, okay, now we have all this data. Where can we go for resources to best interpret it? And I think that's where it's really play, playing a role. Oh, a good question. Why a green laser, not another color? And this is in reference to ISAT 2. Well, there was a satellite called ISAT 1, and it was a near infrared color, so close to red. And that worked equally well. They chose green for power reasons, I believe. Um, and that's as far as I know. So there can be red used, uh, that's equally good, but green works too. Okay, a question. What is the no-go zone on the one map and what makes it a no-go zone? Ah, oh, yes, this, was, this is fun. So when we're trying to measure the reflectivity of the surface, we need to make sure nobody walks on it because that can change it entirely. And a good example of this is if you can see these tracks over my shoulder in this picture. Now, if we were going into the summer melt season, those would form a line of melt pond water. And by the end of the melt season, you would just have a track of water. So this was why we had a no-go zone because we didn't want the surface to be disturbed and artificially affect our measurements of capturing the seasonal evolution of the ice. Yeah, we had to have a lot of no-go zones. Okay. Does the motion of the ice affect melt rate? Does the sea ice melt faster as it is more dynamic? Well, that's a good question. And it depends on the temperature of the air and the temperature of the ocean. I wouldn't say the motion of the ice moving affects it so much, but if you're moving into warmer water and say you have a storm that's pushing you along, that storm's also enhancing the mixing of the surface ocean and that can mix up warmer water and melt the bottom of the ice faster. So while it may not have a direct effect, it can have an indirect effect depending on what the situation is and the environmental conditions. Okay, I'm sure I'm missing some questions, so I'll just scroll around to make sure I have them. Let's see. How did cloud cover and other atmospheric conditions affect albedo measurements? Oh, okay, that's a really nice question. And a good example I can give is during the autumn period when the uh, sun is very low on the horizon. Now, when we measure albedo, we're using this instrument that's measuring the number of fun, uh, photons that are coming down from the sun. And we flip it to measure the number of photons being reflected from the surface. And that ratio gives you the reflectivity, the albedo. Now, if the sun is low on the horizon, it can make it really difficult to measure the number of photons because it's like at a skewed angle and it's really bright. So it's actually a lot easier to get a reliable, less noisy measurement when it's cloudy or foggy because the cloud and fog makes the light diffuse. So all the photons are getting scattered equally. So uh, for the albedo people, we are really happy in the fog, but for other people like the ones doing airborne measurements from helicopters, they were bummed that it was foggy. So it depends on who you ask how it affects their measurements. Okay. There are more, let's see. Please describe measuring the extent of ice in the paleo 
climate record. Oh, okay. So this has a lot to do with the biology that was living at the time. So there are different species that are associated with ice and those species form shells. And these shells are made up of calcium carbonate that have isotopes in them. And those isotopes can give us an idea of what the conditions were like. So whether it was really cold and ice covered around our planet or really warm and less ice covered. So the ratio of the isotopes in those shells are really the, the key thing that tell us what the ice cover was like. Now, when those algae die and the zooplankton die, those shells sink to the seafloor and scientists can take sediment cores of those and analyze the layers and the isotopes within those algae shells to get an idea of how the changes in the ice cover was. So I hope that addresses your question of how the paleoclimate record was tied together for thousands of years for sea ice. Now this is different from ice cores. This is just focused on the sea ice paleoclimate record. Um, let's see. Did you have indigenous representation on the expedition? We did not actually, and that was something that surprised me. And I'm not sure why that was. You know, this was in the Central Arctic and it started in the Central Arctic and I don't know why there wasn't an inclusive action there? Um, that's a really great question. I think it would have benefited with having some representation on board, but hopefully we can change that now that we're starting to look at the data and to tell these stories and to get a better understanding of what this data means. Perhaps that's where indigenous knowledge and indigenous representation can come in. 